Good evening. Welcome to the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. My name is Doug Paul, and I'm Vice President for Studies here. It's my uh, great privilege to welcome so many of you, old friends and, uh, and acquaintances uh, of the Carnegie Program on China and Asia to uh, what I think is a really wonderful event tonight. We're very privileged to have with us someone I've admired for uh, quite a few years for um, not only his many academic and administrative accomplishments, but also for his spirit of candor and friendship and uh, openness. Uh, really uh, typ typifies the better face of China these days. Um, today, Professor Xu Guangdi will speak to us about addressing climate change and challenging the status quo, as you've seen from the handout. Um, as I'm sure you're aware from the handout, he is serving as the president of the Chinese Academy of Engineering. I look around, I don't see too many engineers here. <laughs> but I think we've got plenty of people interested in what he has to say because he also serves on the Chinese Political Consultative Conference as a vice chairman and as former mayor of Shanghai. He left a record of accomplishment that anyone in administration anywhere would be envious of. Um, I won't go into all the details in the bureau. i just point out that one of the functions that uh, Professor Xu now serves is as a um, uh, President of the China-U.S. People's Friendship Association. So not only will you have a chance to hear him tonight talking in his uh, eloquent way about uh, climate in China and the U.S., but you may also have a chance to be hosted by him on a visit to Beijing if your organization takes you there. So you look forward to repeating your acquaintance at, in the future. Okay. <laughs> but for, at first, I have to give a couple of administrative uh, points to you. First, in the interest of candor and openness, tonight's remarks will be not for attribution. And I think we'll have a better conversation if you can respect that not for attribution char uh, characterization. Secondly, because of the sound system in this room, it's very sensitive to um, internet and the like, and so the, the loudspeaker system will react to cell phones and blackberries that are left on. <laughs> so I ask you to turn those off uh, so we don't have any interruption un unnecessarily. Um, Kevin, it's my great privilege and uh, honor to welcome tonight and, and present to you Professor Xu Kuangdi. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to have this opportunity to dialogue with you. I am not a speaker, I am a dialogue person. And uh, today's topic is how China is addressing this climate change and uh, to developing the low carbon economy. Uh, Ten years ago, there is a hot debate, the climate change getting warmer or not. But nowadays, I think climate change is an undisputed fact. Here we can see the figure. I'm sorry, I must go down. Within 200 years, my voice is enough, I think. Within 200 years, the slide warmer, but the last 100 years, the average temperature in the Earth increased 0.74 degrees centigrade. And the last 50 years, this speed increased two times, and if we look back to, chen, to last 20 years, it's even faster to increase. Yes, yeah, thank you. And uh, here we can see the Chinese saturation, China saturation here, and uh, the temperature increase even higher than the rest of the world. Only this over this process, this period, the temperature is not increased but decreased because Cultural Revolution. No economic activities, no carbon emission. Everyone go to the street. <laughs> so, and the temperature change periodically is a natural things. So, ten, twenty years ago. Someone said it's not human behavior to change the temperature. Yes, 400,000 years ago, they start to change. 
and the periodinal curve. But we can find that the CO2 is very close to the temperature change here, and the human activities increase the CO2 in the Earth is very fast. And the Copenhagen meeting, for most the scientists hope, we can control the stop less than 500 ppm. We are worried about the future because when the world is getting warmer, the glaciers melting down. Here we can see the glaciers in Himalaya, very famous one. And uh, during the last 50 years, it's uh, reduced by 21%. So it's a big amount. One-fifth of them melting down now. And if they keep this melting speed, by year 2050, another reduced by 27%. And we, all of us knows, the Himalaya mountain and the Tibet highland is the water tower for whole Asia. The Yellow River, Yangtze River, Lanchang River, when they go to uh, Thailand and they go to Vietnam called the Mei Gong River, Mei Nan River, and they go to the, the, the Yellow Zhang River, go to Indian, they call the Indian River. So this is big fresh water resources. So we can see the cases of climate change from the two parts. One is natural cases. Of course, they have natural cases there. The volcano activities, the solar activities give a lot of influence for climate change. But the human behaviors is also give the very strong influence of the climate change, which including the greenhouse gas emissions, the aerosols in the earth, and also changing in land using. The green land, the forest, they cut down, build their factories and build their new cities. Then you put cement on the surface, this destroy the ecology and the urbanization process. During the last 30 years, the Chinese economy grew very fast, uh, about uh, 17 times compared with its the figure during the Cultural Revolution. But remember one thing. When you increase your GDP output, it means you increase CO2 emissions. And also, the urbanization ratio in China is increased rapidly during the last 15 years. When we celebrate the new China one week ago, the one established People's Republic, the, pop, the city population only takes 12% in China. 88% of the people living in countryside, they are farmers' family. My grandpa is a farmer. He living in a small village and he never be moved outside the Zhejiang province. And this figure increased by first 10 years. But after that, the Cultural Revolution came. So this, uh, the figure stopped around the 18% because the Chairman Mao asked all the young Students, when they graduate from middle school, they must have re got re-education from the farmers. But this, the, the re-education is no period. The people don't know if they stay say, three years, four years, five years. The longest one, eight years. So the city population became stable. Then after that, Deng Xiaoping said they must have back to city and go back to university. So it's recovered. And then, when economy booming, especially after China access to entrance to WTO, this figure is very fast. It's 45.69 now, percent now. It means we use big amount of land, change the land you, you, 
utilization system. And then you put a lot of cement on the, sur on the, on the land, and uh, this is uh, just I mentioned before, the urbanization is the human behavior to destroy the ecology. So now we must be facing some situation of China's CO2 emission. And uh, we just want to, I, I, I don't read all of this. I want to take po two points. 2007, China's CO2 emission reached 5.96 billion tons. And over the past day, United States, 5.82 became the first in the world. This is not good record. It's not like in Olympic game, you got the new record. This is a bad record. And also the global carbon emission increased one third in the past eight years. And we, of which two thirds from China. So this is a very, very hard challenge for Chinese, both Chinese people and the government. But remember one thing, even though China's per capita emission is only 4.32 tons, and uh, the world average level, including Africa and the undeveloped countries, 4.18. So China is a little bit higher than the average level, but compared with our neighbor, India, we are 3.7 times of them. So this is the problem So China must be facing. So President Hu Jintao said, climate change is an issue involving both environment and development, but it's uh, ultimately an issue of development. Without development, no carbon issue problem. So here is the Chinese officials' principle, and uh, these f four points was pointed by President Hu Jintao on the General Assembly meeting United Nations a few weeks ago. And uh, I think the, the core of those principles is here. Yes, China will follow the principle of common but differential responsibilities. It means China should, should, should fuel the development, but should reduce the cost of development. Each unit of GDP growth should, conception the energy should reduce year by year. The second part, the seven energy reduce emission and the developing sector economy is the first step of to low carbon economy. Top carbon, the low carbon economy, a lot of scientists or some, some non-government organizations say we must change the rule. We, 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 we don't use any fossil energy, we should use the hydrogen or any clean, those kind of clean in energy. Of course, in principle it's right, but there is a very expensive way to got the pure hydrogen. Because in the world there's no hydrogen. We must use another energy to transfer from the fossil energy to, to hydrogen. So the first step, we think we must save energy, reduce emission, and the develop a cycle economy. Look about here. When the nation or society during the early developing stage, they developed the light and the textile industries and mainly used the agricultural products as a raw material. So this is energy intensity, lower period, low period. Then came to the second period for heavy and chemical industry stage. They want to ship yard, build an automobile, steel industry, cement industry, and so on. Then the continuous increase the energy intensity. After 
the middle part of the industrialization, they, they change the mode to assembling and the deep processing uh, in this, a, this stage. Then the energy intensity coming down. Most OECD country just during after here and now, then they feel they develop not manufacturing but the tertiary industry, service industry. So, so you can see here, China's uh, energy intensity is about 0.86. Of course, it's lower than former Soviet Union, but it's much higher than OECD country, 0.2 only. This is the, the fact. So we should think about how to change the saturation, not use the older model to develop a white economy. Here is very famous, the inverted U curve given by Kuznetsov, the, the famous ecologist in the world. He said, when you want to got the prosperity life from beginning, it's, the people is poor, but it's, it's clean. Everything is follow the organic law. But when you use industrialization, the people are getting richer, but the country were dirty. So it's uh, rich and the dirty. This is between 6,000 to 8,000 US dollar per capita to any country. It's like that. In 1920 to 1940s in Pittsburgh, Chicago, and uh, Detroit, and another uh, big industry center, and also 1960 in Japan, and 1970, early 1970 in Western Germany, they, are, they got the rich and the dirty period. But now most of these country, after 12,000 years started to get, they get cut the pollution down because they change the development mode. Then you will be rich and clean, like in Washington, D.C., beautiful blue sky. And uh, once upon a time, I gave this report to our leader in our country, and uh, one leader said, Kuang Di, could you please find a way to dig in a channel between the poor and the rich without the dirty? I said, no, because the world is made by materials, not made by philosophy or some dream. We say sitting in the house, they use the steel and they use the cement, and the, if you finish all this infrastructure construction, you can got the clean society. And also, technology progress give a big help for the reduce the density, energy intensities. Here we can see, during the 1860 to 1880, this is the peak of UK industrialization. And this period, the Le the energy intensity is over than one, and then the U.S. came became industrialization country in the 1900 to 1930. The peak is lower than U.K. The peak, the, the top peak is about 0.95. So why? Because U.K. use steam boiler and the steam engine. But now the U.S. can they use the electricity and the diesel engine. So the high efficiency and the low emission. And then Germany can. The same technology as the United States. Most of they learn from the United States. But Germany engineer and the Germany workers work seriously. There are no coffee break time. Uh, no one during the working time wrote about newspaper. So their work efficiency is a little bit higher than the United States. But how about the French? French is also very low. French is romantic people, romantic Nancy. <laughs> eh, but however, their physics is very, very intelligent. They are physics. So they developed a nuclear power to instead of coal power. There are no coal, no oil, no natural gas in France, but they developed a nuclear. So 
So their labor density is much lower than, than Germany and the U.S. Then after the Second World War, the Japan came there. And the, they learned something from France. And the, now that the, the energy construction uh, in Japanese uh, structure is about uh, 50% come from, 50 to 60%, depending on which season, come from nuclear power station. So their energy emission is very low. Now China just here. Our total emission is nearby Japan now. So what is the direction for China? And we look about the world. This is the GDP per capita. And this is the, the, the energy, the primary energy consumption. Uh, we can see the Canada, Norway, and the United, United States of America is on top because those two countries is very cold. So they need heating the house for 10 months in a year. But why United States such high? Because everyone have a car, they're consuming a big amount of gasoline, not heating the house, but with the gasoline and the waste guy on the road. I think maybe few amount of these American people like try to use train. They prefer cars and aeroplane. So, and the rest the highest Australia, they, 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 their behavior is very similar with the United States. It's a warm country, but they use big, that's big country. They use car transportation. And Saudi Arabia and the former, uh, the, the Russians. The South Korea, the economy and Japan is here. So they are not very high. Now, we must think about China, Brazil, and the Indian here. If Developing country increase the economy, develop the economy, use three, follow the three standard core tones per capita, then we can develop on this line. If the four tones this line, five tones this line, six tones this line. So reduce the conception of energy is the first stage. So here we can see, during the last uh, 20 years, China's energy intensity is reduced year by year. But these two or three years, I think between 2000 and 2006, because the economy a little bit overheat, I think. So this cover up. If no action, no con without control, it's maybe developed in this way. And now we hope we can find a way to in this way. But the optimization is should be follow this way. If we can follow this way to 2019, we can reach the level as Japanese uh, and age high, rev high uh, efficiency. But uh, I can't believe because I think that the Japanese people are doing things much better than Chinese workers and uh, staffs inside the enterprises. So maybe we can have the middle way here. We, then we were lucky. We can have the some level like in uh, Scandinavia countries and other countries. Here is the, the fact of the why China's carbon emission is so high, because all energy is depending on the coal, much depending on coal. And in 1995, this figure is 75%, but now it's reduced to 70% nearby. We want to further de decrease this figure, this percentage. <laughs> and this is the ratio of energy consumption sectors of China. Uh, <clears throat> 20 years ago, it takes about 60 for industry and the very few for transportation, about 8%. Now, this industry decreased for a little bit more than 50%, but the transportation increased too fast. 
for 17 percent. And uh, this is a figure of 2007. Suppose this year we reach about 20 percent because of the automobile industry just booming in China. And uh, it's become a fashion to buy a new car. So when the young students graduate from university, found their first job, the, two, the parents and the, the two side of grandparents give them as a souvenir. They save money for a long time, then they buy a new car for the young, gen, young, young boy or young girls. This is a pity. Last, uh, <laughs> it's, it's lucky for young person. But I think it's, uh, it's not good for this whole country. We are not very happy because the first eight months in China, we sold a little bit more than nine million vehicles, the passengers' cars, rank the first in the world. And the United States, the second, seven million. So this is uh, not very good news. We, we are not put on the newspaper because we think we must a little bit of control to most people use the mass transportation system, not only for saving money, not only for saving the, <coughs> the, the, the we, we should saving the gasoline, oil, and to protect the environment. <coughs> so the China's low carbon economy strategy is stage by stage. The first is energy saving, increase efficiency and decrease, reduce the emission. Because the Chinese industry's energy utilization efficiency is lower than the world advanced level. If we can nearby this level, for instance, nearby Republic of Korea or nearby uh, another UK, European Union countries, not as Japan. Japan is the top. They, they have very, very high efficiency. If we can meet the over the average level, yeah, but then, then we can save about 20% of energy. This is the first step. Then core, clean core energy, so-called clean core combustion technology, CCCT. And this technology, I think, will be Co collaboration development by U.S. and China because both countries are rich in coal and uh, a big amount of coal use. And the, in the meantime, we must develop the nuclear and the renewable energy without any carbon emission. Here we don't like to read because this is shows the, some progress of the high energy consumption industry in China which including my major, the steel industry. And here is the circular economy uh, example to show you is the Pingshuo mine, coal mine area of Sanxi province. The Pingshuo coal mine was first capital investment from United States. Dr. Hammer put investment in 1979 and uh, now this, this mine doing very nice job. They not only produce the coal, but also use the low quality of the coal, the high quality coal they go to the market. And in the lower one, they have their own power plant to, to, to translate to electricity to support their own industry. And they use all the slags and the ashes to produce silicon and aluminum to further use that. The finally, the, 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 the red mash they use for the cement after the it electrolyzed of aluminum. Here you can see not, they are not only produce coal, but also produce a lot of things. It means high utilization of raw materials and the same energy. And uh, also they recovery all the, the, the coal mine. This is during operating and the, the before uh, reclimating, this is that since a lot of deaths and a lot of uh, sandstone. And then during the 
uh, recovery and after reclamation, that is a forest and a grass back. So this is very important. We must uh, not waste the land. We must uh, reuse it. Another example is Peking cement plant. This is uh, one of the big pollution plant in nearby the Beijing. And we change the process and use the waste, uh, city waste garbage and uh, the solid waste to become uh, energy and uh, raw materials for the cement plant. So every year they can, they can utilization about 100,000 tons of those waste from the city, mainly industrial in, uh, factories waste. This is the technical program. I, this is not in MIT, so I don't like to explain you in detail. <laughs> and also this one. I, I give this lecture in MIT yesterday. They were very interesting from engineering school and from. Here is my major, so I want to say a few words for this pic picture. You know, there is uh, one of the famous iron steel corporation in Beijing there, just a celebration, 100 years anniversary. And uh, because it's near Beijing, the conception, big amount of coal and uh, produce a big amount of uh, uh, dust and waste gas. So before the Olympic game, Premier Zhu Rongji heard a meeting say, you, you, if you can't cut down this factory, we can't reach the air quality for, for Olympic game. So, but someone say, oh, we have such a long history. We have a very good tradition and we present five billion yuan tax for the city government and so on. He said, you are not capital steel works. We need a capital. We don't need a capital steel works. <laughs> so then cut down. Cut down, then we, we have a big amount of workers. We can transfer this factory from Beijing to Bohai Bay, a small island, and use the total new process. And not only produce high quality steel for eight to 10 million tons a year, but also they can receive the waste, the garbage from big city like 140 to 280 tons of waste plastics and uh, 1.2 million tons of scrap steers. And also this process can collect all the waste gas from the uh, oven and the furnace to transfer to electric power. So they can produce 1.2 gigawatt power in a year, and they use the, the new method for the process, so the, the slag from the blast furnace and the, the <coughs> steel making converters can, the slag can become a, the raw material of the cement plant. So instead digging the mountain to take the limestone from the natural mountain. So, this is a success, and the last, last month I went to this place called Cao Fei Dian, and uh, I'm feeling very honored to, to making the first heat of the steer, and uh, the whole process without workers is automatically and uh, computer control. So we welcome all the environment protecting peoples, which including government sector and the non-government sector, to visit this plant to see. And we try to rebuild our steel industry in this case. And another one is a small one, but very important things. It's one overseas Chinese student back from Germany and he have such a patent and uh, technology to reuse the, the, this is plastic one? No. Glass. Plastic. Glass. This is the soft butter called the PET, uh, the PET plastic, like uh, 
mini water or or Coca Cola. He can recover those waste to become a raw materials and reused to produce the bottom. So he make the uh, proposal for the government. He try to have a ultra clean bottle to bottle process. Life of a PET bottle. So this was accepted by the Olympic Organization Committee and uh, helped him to build a factory nearby the downtown city. This is means use different kind of way to recover the, the bottle and then crashed in the small size and, and the deep clean CC and, and the purification because it's put some liquid in drink. So, and then you can re, Produce the potter, and uh, it's a uh, private enterprises. He bring technology back and invite some uh, investors foundation to put investment there, and he got very good results. Every year they can receive fifty thousand tons waste plastic from city of Beijing, and uh, can save it all year three hundred kilotons, and uh, can reduce. CO2 emission for 150,000 tons. This is a good. And also, he is a postal doctor. Now he became a millionaire. And uh, not only for those guys who can own the patents, if we save energy, we should save it from the end user. For the engineering point of view, the electricity the end user only can take one fourth to one fifth energy from the beginning. So if we can save energy in the end user, then the four or five times saving for the primary resources. And the same thing happened in the case of vehicle energy saving. Only 13% of the gasoline used for driving the car. And another 87 of the fuel energy is wasted by the process and by the uh, fractions and so on. So less than one-fifth of energy left to drive the wares from the exported oil. So we must develop a new kind of vehicles more light, more saving energy engines, and then we can reduce a big amount of uh, emission. Another one thing is for the building. Here we can see the Qinghua Hall. It was built in 1905, designed by American civil engineering graduate from Harvard University. And this is all type of building, but the energy consumption is very low, 3, 34 kilowatt hour per meters per year. And then this is 2005 to build a new government building in Beijing. This is also American architect designed. The energy consumption is 113 kilowatt hours per meter, square meter per, per year. I'm sorry, this is a, a mansion in Shanghai. This is called the Jin Mao building or a, a Grand Hyder building. This is also designed by Chicago firm. It's a, called SOM. SOM, very famous. But the energy consumption is 215 kilowatt hour per square meter per year. And the, the last one is the UPenn office headquarters. University of Pennsylvania. This building in U.S. is 356 kilowatt hour per square meter per year. So, the time for, from the time being, the, the architect they don't care the energy consumption. They only look about the, the shape, beautiful shape like this. 
It's a pagoda, like a Chinese pagoda for Buddhism, from Buddhism. And this one is very fry, very light, but they lose off a lot of energy. The older building, they have very sickness of the war and very low energy consumption. So yesterday, I have been MIT, and after my presentation, one professor came to me. He is the dean of the Department of Architect. He said, you are very right. We should change your Because he said, he is old man, old gentleman, old professor. He said, nowadays, the young generation of architects, they want to design very strange building, not for energy saving, just for the ship, like the fashion shoe, you know? Also, for the, for the illumination, they developed the last time the, the semiconductor LED lights. This is very, very important. In China, we will do our best to, to further extend the market. If one third of market use the LED lights, then the energy saving is equal to two, three gorgeous power station produced electricity in a year. So the government should start from the road lamp, the, the, the street lights, because it's built by the different ratio of government. They first will use the LED. And also the personal behavior is very, very important. We have an investigation in Zhongguanchun. One old apartment building built was early 1980, and all the, uh, all the people living in this building is middle income family, which some of them work in Tsinghua, some of them from Beida, and some of them is uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences. The 25 families, their air conditioning conception of electricity is very big differences. It's depending on how do you use the air conditioner. Most people, especially young people, like in the summer, they want to have a 20 to 22 degrees and degree inside the house, then take all clothes away with a, a smart shoot only. And in the winter time, they like to have 26 to 28 degrees and degree, then they they, they, they think it's very smart because they went back, they're feeling very warm. But it, if you increase one degree centigrade inside the building, it means lose a lot of energy. So now in China, we learn from Japanese government, all the official building in the summertime should control the 26 degree centigrade, not lower than this temperature. Also transportation. Here is an example. In Shanghai, we do investigation. The rail transportation and the taxi, the conception of the energy is by 30 times. So in, in the big city, especially in the Chinese city, we think we, we will not further develop the taxi system. We will develop the, the train underground train and some light rail, light rail train. Here we don't, I, I think we have no time to in detail to, to improve the energy utilization of the, our transportation system. In simplified say, we must utilize the waterway to instead of only use the highway or train. Third is accelerating the development of nuclear power of, to meet the recent demands of increased energy consumption and uh, improved environment in the eastern part of China. You know, the Chinese economy was very concentrated in the eastern coast of China. About 20% of the land but produced about 80% of GDP. So in this area, there are less of energy. And the most coal mine and the oil field and the natural gas is the 
western part of China. So in this, in this case, in, in order to meet the demand, demand, demand of the energy and also to protect the eastern part of China's environment, we dis make a decision to put number, quite a number of nuclear power stations based by 1,000 megawatt plus water reactor power station. Now, seven of them during construction, and uh, I think it will be very fast to put into operating because we have cooperation with some advanced uh, com countries, uh, company to do some cooperation. Here we can show, this is use coal, your conception, a big amount of uh, uh, emission, a big amount of carbon. Then you change it to oil, it's a little bit less. If solar, it's about uh, one-fifth, but hydro, even lower. And the bio mass, uh, mass and the wind is low, but the lowest is nuclear. Why? People think the solar is no, no, car no carbon emission at all. This is the wrong concept. Because the solar, they have different time, different weather, they have different electricity supply. In the daytime, they have received some energy from solar, but in the night, they don't. So you have a storage, the energy during the daytime. This is a, should go to put it into battery. That is this DC system. Then in the evening time, you should use the DC transport to AC. They use for everything, for lights, for 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 daily use, machines, and so on. So, the nuclear power will be most lower carbon emission. And the target for Chinese government and the enterprises is 2007. We only have 1.2 energy from nuclear power. And 2020, to, uh, 2020, it will increase to 5%. And the 2030, the figure was 10%, so it's tremendous increase from the nuclear power. If you look about this, only 10 times about, but the total amount of the energy was increased about another two times, so this is a big amount. Finally, we need accelerating the development of renewable energy to move to green and the low carbon economy. This is the this third step, I think. Here we can, the most difficulties for the renewable energy is the cost. The solar and the windmill, their cost about, nowadays it's cost about 20 to 30 cents per kilowatt hours electricity. This is much higher than the coal fired generation generators. It's normal. The coal power is about six cents per kilo hour, kilo, kilowatt hours. But to 2020, it's a nearby. So we think we can learn something from Germany. If you have a renewable energy, Government pay you a substate for operating, but the substate is not from government, from the added tax for the coal burning generator. The, the tax got them from then they put in to, to that substate for the no carbon emission energy. Here is the windmill developed in EU, EU country. The best is in Denmark. But also the windmill has some problem from technical point of view. Nowadays, the biggest one is about five megawatt each unit, the capacity. But 
five u five megawatt. It means the wing of the the, the, the diameter of the wing is one hundred and twenty six meters. The biggest Airbus A third three hundred eighty. The wind space only eighty meters. So this one should have very very nice materials for stand such a long wings, and uh, the, it's very expensive. It's uh, carbon components, carbon fiber components. And uh, so we in China, most of us use for 0.5 megawatt uh, wind unit. Then, then we can produce, use all homemade materials and put a lot of those away. Here is the re region map of wind energy, mainly concentrated in Tibet, Qinghai, and in the Mongolia, Gansu, in the Mongolia area. This is the our target, how to fill the develop the wind energy in China. Here is the region map of solar resources in China. Also in this area, it's very high because it's a very dry area without rain, big raining. So that's uh, very good for, because there is a, it's a need energy for future development. And about 96 of China's territory has advanced for the to the solar energy resources. And uh, hopefully it can use, we, if we only use 2% of the, the Gobi Desert or 20% of the whole roof for the hot water supply, then we can have 2.2 billion kilowatt the capacity of energy. This is a big amount. And also biomass. This is during development, but mainly we transit the biomass to a gas or liquid to use for chemical process to instead of uh, crude oil and the natural gas. And also hydropower resources. We are big amount of hydropower in south southwestern part of China, Yunnan, Sichuan, and the Guizhou province. And uh, there is another 60% of those resources haven't developed. But, I must say, but, there is a hot debate even inside the engineering society. We should further develop the hydropower, or we should stop. Because if you use the hydropower, you should build a, build a big dam. Big dam is cost a lot of money, and also you stop the fishes through the way. And most fish, they, they grow from the sweet water, sweet water, then they go to ocean. And the several years that when they grew their back, they can't find a way because you build a new power station there. So maybe we will slow down the process because the ecologist and the, uh, the, the, there's a very hot discussion on the internet website. And also we can use geo, Geothermal energies. In China, we have two, found 255 area with temperature of the geothermal resource about 150 degrees centigrade can be used for electricity generation. So this is very good because when we use this heat, we can bump in the water back to the, to the underground. Then we don't destroy any, uh, ecology and uh, we are no emission at all. 
So this is important. Here we have a road map for renewable energy in China. The coming years, it will increase to 10%, which including hydro, nuclear, and the renewable windmill and the solar. And the 2020, it will increase to 16 to 23 percent. It's depending on how many hydropower stations were approved by the government. So this is a, 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 a game. And the 2030, it will reach 20 to 30 percent. And the 2050, about 30 to 40 percent. It's depending on the hydraulic powers and depending on the technology further developed for solar and for windmill. So I, I think we will, I will finish my presentation and I, I'm not reading really the conclusion again because everyone can got conclusion by yourself. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>